Hello again and uh, welcome to our third part of our Bible College module on Who is Man? Um, I'm Dr. Alan Wright. You'll see we're, we're onto the um, four states of man now and uh, we're looking at the first state of man which is perfection. Um, it's not saying that I'm perfection by the way on the screen that's just uh, amusement for myself but um, we're looking at who man is, what, what makes each man uh, individually and uh, uh, each of us important. And one of the things that's very significant is how God has made us. Um, and that's what we're looking at when we're thinking about the four states of man. So last, last time out in the first section, we were looking at the evidence that there's, there's much more to what we are than just animals. And um, we're very significantly different from animals in so many ways and that's important to remember because then that leads later on you'll see in in parts 7 8 and 9 and 10 to understanding who we are our responsibility how we're made in the image of God and what that means and how we value ourselves and what our identity is but we we start there and we say well if the evidence is that we're not um from animals that we're not just another animal then what is the evidence? What can we see? And does it match with what the Bible says? But how do we understand what the Bible says um, man is all about? And so we're going to take that process and look at what, what the Bible says about man and compare it with the evidence in our world. The first stage is that the Bible says that man was made perfect. And we're going to look a little bit at well, what does man look like when he's perfect? What does, what, what does that look like? What's the reality of that? And do we see evidence of that? Is there evidence of that? Then we'll move on to that man fell, that, that we sinned, um, that man can be renewed or redeemed or restored, um, and that man is made for glory, for eternity in heaven. And, and we'll look at those stages or states. We were just discussing whether stages or states are the same thing, um, that the four states of man don't all occur at once. Um, so maybe stages is fine um, because they, they happen in stages. They don't all happen at the same time. However, um, it is quite um, important that we understand that there are different states. They almost asking the question, are they different creatures? So each time we, we look at one of the states of man, you, you, you've got to ask, is the evidence there for that? What does the evidence say about that? And also then, um, what does it look like? Is it, is it real? And, and is it different from the other states? Is this a whole different thing? Um, the question is, is God doing a whole different thing? each time. So let's have a look at the first state of man, which is perfection. We're going to start with um, a question. Uh, we always have a discussion question. If you want to pause and chat with whoever's nearest you or um, uh, bring it to the discussion that we'll have on, on Thursday night or Wednesday afternoon. Um, the first question is, discussion question is, what were Adam and Eve like before the fall? We're wanting to say, well, if man is uniquely made, if Adam and Eve were uniquely made, what were they like? Now, that's not because Adam and Eve are everything that we want to be. We need to understand that that was not the fulfillment of all of God's plan. But it's a great starting place to understand what God made. What were Adam and Eve like and, and what was special? So stop and stop the video if it helps. Have a wee think, what were Adam and Eve like? Okay, I'm going to give you a few of the answers that the Bible gives that we can see. Um, in Genesis 1, 27, it says that we're made in the image of God. Um, and that's really important. It's a very significant thing to say about man. Is man special? Well, he's made in the image of God. Other animals, I said other animals, bad me, animals were made to do different things to to live and move and and jump around and, and and fly and swim and all sorts of interesting things some of which we can't do and some of which we can but 
then it says that God said, right, I've made all those animals. Now I'm going to make man in my image. So what does that specifically mean? Well, what is the image of something? I mean, at the moment, I hope you can see the image of me on the computer screen. It's a little reflection taken from my little camera on the machine. Um, and, and you're looking at an image of me. What does that mean? You can see something that looks like me, that you know comes from me. Um, I mean, it isn't me. It's just a, an image on a screen, right? It's not me. It's an image of me. So we reflect God. We, we show a lot of what he's like. We, we look like him and do the things that he does and, and so on. Um, and Adam and Eve in particular were made in the image of God um, before we ruined that image. And, and that image uh, is not God. We're not saying that we are God, but we look a lot of ways like him, a reflection of him. Sometimes I talk about a diamond it, that the light hits it and you see facets of the light. And each of us reflect God in different ways. You'd see different facets of who God is um, through reflecting through us. It's not that the diamond is the light. It just reflects the light. And so we see this image of God in human beings. Well, in what ways does man reflect the image of God? We can see a lot of things um, in, in who we are that, that say um, there's a lot of God in that. Now let's start with the fact that we have a, a mind, a body, and a soul. We are three in one, if you will, triune, um, that, that I have a mind that thinks maybe not very well most of the time, but it thinks I have a body that is uniquely me, and so is my mind. Uh, you can't separate the two. If the, the two are separated, it's not me. Um, and I have a spirit, I have a soul that says, I have, I'm eternal and there's something bigger and, and looks to a connection with God. And, and so there's three parts of me. And if you take any one part away, it's not me. And this is the same with God. We're made in the image of God. Not only that, we're made to do amazing, right, righteous things. We're, we're made to be beautiful and, and do good. And man is capable of amazing good. God gave Adam and Eve the, the role of looking after all the animals and caring for the world. And, and he was very capable of it because he was made in the image of God. He was good and could do all these amazing things and bring glory to God um, through what he does. The reflection of somebody should, should reflect and, and bring light and, and, and reflect hopefully well on, on the person that it's talking about. And we're made to reflect well on who God is. Now, we haven't always lived up to that image. We haven't always done a very good job of living it well. But we're made as a reflection of who God is. Can you think of other ways? I'll, I'll let you talk about this when we talk about it at the, at the groups on Wednesday and Thursday. But think of other ways that we reflect the image of God. What is it that we are that also God is? that is meant to show not just this world, but the universe and all the principalities and powers, who God is and what he's like. There's many ways we're made in the image of God. I particularly just want to focus on one, just the ability to love, the ability to care and to empathize and to, to feel for someone and to do something for them. That's costly. That is the image of God because that is who God is. God is love. God is light in him. There's no darkness at all. But God is love and he cares for those who are broken and, and confused and messed up. So maybe as you think about it, you think, yeah, that's true. There's something in man capable of great love. And that is who we are. So one of the things about what Adam and Eve were when God made them, they reflected back to God some of his own beauty. And it's amazing. And not just back to God, but to the whole universe, showing how amazing God is. 
then we can say that you can read it in Genesis 2, uh, that God breathed life into the man in, in Genesis 2, 7. As God breathes, breathes life into him, um, God breathed life into all the animals. He gave them life. But there's something different about man. That God breathed life in, into us uniquely. With the animals, it talks about him giving them breath. But in a way, it says he made man and then he breathed life into him. And the, the word is the same word that's used, the breath and the spirit. That God gave man a unique breath, a unique experience of the world, a unique experience of the universe, and, and a unique experience of life. That God breathed an eternity into them. Remember in Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says that God put eternity into the hearts of men. And so God gave us this uh, unique spirit and unique breath that makes us eternal, that makes us um, connect with God in a, in a more real way. We're made for spiritual connection. We're made to imagine the universe and experience it far more than animals experience. Man is made with an experiential knowledge of things. We have an experiential knowledge of God. That's what we're made for. And so God breathed a spirit into us that is looking for eternal, that is looking for bigger connections, that is looking for life everlasting. That meaning and that purpose is all connected because God breathed into us something that isn't satisfied with just this physical world. So Adam and Eve, as they walked around the garden, there was more than just um, a, a rightness and a, a, a goodness about, there was this experience of God. We'll come to a little bit more to that in a minute. But God breathed into them this life, this spiritual thing. And the connection that Adam and Eve had was more than just um, a physical sexual relationship. Anyone who's been in a serious relationship knows that the bond that brings you together is more than just we've spent a lot of time together. We, we have relations. Um, there's something more intimate because that's how man is designed. We're given a spirit that is, is meant for intimacy, meant for connection with God, meant to think bigger, meant for eternity. And all of those things are very real. So Adam and Eve were given this, this image of God and looked like him, and they were given this spirit of God and, and they connect with him and connect with one another on a, on a level that's more than just um, physical. Then we can read, as God goes through all of creation, he says it's good. And he says um, that the animals are good. The, the, the land is good. The sky is good. The sun, the moon, they're good. They're, they're, very, they're, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're good. And then he says, but here's what this was all created for. And he puts man in the middle of it. And he says, now it's very good. Now it's right. This is the culmination of what I've been doing. Adam and Eve were considered the culmination of God's plan in time. Not just on our world, because it talks about the sun and the moon and the stars as well. Actually, human beings were the center of all that is temporal. Now, that's quite a big statement to make. You know, Sam 8 that we were quoting at the start of the module says that, that um, what is man that you're mindful of him? You made him just a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honor and subdued everything under his feet. And the picture is that, that man is given this amazing role in all the universe that, that God says, this is the pinnacle of what I'm doing. We might believe in aliens. We might imagine there's more out there. But God says, no, this is the pinnacle of what I'm doing. This is, now it's ready. 
before these things were coming together and it was good and everything was, was what it was supposed to be. But now with man in the middle of it, it fits. It is what it's meant to be. And so God says the world is good, but man is very good. We're made with very good material, with very good purpose, with, with hope that is good, with life meant to be lived for good and to do good. And God says he is very pleased. He was very pleased with all he had made. When he put man in the middle of it, it worked. It fitted. It was exactly what he planned to do. And he says that's very good. So Adam and Eve, as they were made, were exactly what God meant them to be. They fitted and they were, they were good. And, and all the world made a bit more sense because man was there. And this picture is that, that Adam and Eve, made in the image of God, breathed life into by God, are exactly what God wants. And yet it wasn't meant to be the end of the story. It was never meant to be the end of the story. And Adam and Eve are not the pinnacle of what God has done. We'll come to that as we go through the four states of man. This is just the first one. If this was good enough, there wouldn't be a second state of man or a third state of man or a fourth state of man. If this was everything that God had imagined for man, then this would have been it. There would only be one state of man because God doesn't make mistakes. If there's no reason to, to change it, he wouldn't have made it this way. So Adam and Eve were, were beautiful, made in the image of God, reflecting his beauty, his love and his life. They were given this life breathed in by the spirit that, that gave them an eternity and a meaning and a connection with God and one another. And they were considered very good by God. Isn't that amazing? You're walking around the garden and God doesn't see a problem. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. They communicate with God. It's great. That's what it was like. And God put them in that place and he said, well, I've, I've not only just made you, I've, I've got a particular role for you. You're supposed to be fruitful and to subdue the world, to go and rule over it. And as, as people, um, we're meant to be fruitful and we're meant to go and, and rule over the world. And I, I know that means that one person tries to rule all, over all of the, the others and, and we end up with wars and, and things that aren't godly. But we're made in the image of God and, and God is, is fruitful. And as he leads in things and takes control of things and subdues them, he's not doing them harm. He's doing them good. And we're supposed to rule over the world and take care of it and, and bless it and add to the beauty of it. And Adam and Eve took care of the garden and walked in it and, and, and looked after the animals. There was a connection and a meaning and a purpose. They were living not just because God said, right, okay, you're doing a good job. That's great. Sit there. do That's fine. That's all I want. They're living out purpose. They're being fruitful and, and they're working in the world and making the difference and, and reaching out. So Adam and Eve are, are amazing and beautiful, exactly what God wanted. And he said, that is really good. I'm pleased with that. And then he said to them, and, and, and I don't want you to feel useless or meaningless. I've got jobs for you. I've got life for you. Go and, and be fruitful, have children, and they've spread out across the world, subdue it, bless the animals, take care of the world, and, and be connected with me as you walk and live and move. There's more. Um, I'm not finished there. So um, the notes you'll notice are quite long. Um, and we're going to continue with just some of the thoughts of what Adam and Eve were like. One of the things was he said to Adam and Eve, he said particularly to Adam, you can do whatever you want. You can eat of any tree except that one. And in giving him one choice, he's making him responsible and he's giving him free will. He's saying to Adam and Eve, um, God is saying to them, you are 
are able to make your own choices. You are not robotic. You are not instinctive. Animals live by instinct. I have not done that with you. I'm giving you a choice. I'm giving you free will. I'm giving you character that has the right to choose and, 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 a, and a way to live where you have choice. And there's something uh, beautiful about not being tied to um, train tracks, but being able to fly over all sorts of things. We're not tied to this is what you're designed for. This is exactly where you will go and how you will live. We're made with this beautiful ability to be three dimensional and to rise up and to fly and to move. And I know we can't physically fly. We were talking about this at church on Sunday um, that we'll rise up on wings like eagles. But just the picture that we, we're meant to, to have choice and be able to go different ways and and, and expand our horizons and think beyond and imagine more. God made us um, with this incredible free will. And this is where people start to think, well, that was a mistake. That was a problem. That led to sin. Um, but actually, that ability to choose and to move and to change and to decide and to live out, not mechanically or instinctively, but live freely is a beautiful thing. Adam and Eve would have chosen where they went to sleep, where they got up. Well, where they went to sleep is where they would have gotten up, I suppose. But what, what, where they took the animals, what fruit they ate off the trees. They would have chosen which direction they would walk in the garden. They would have chosen every day what they would go and see and investigate and find out more about. The freedom that we have is a beautiful thing. And God said, I've made you in my image. And one of the things about being in my image is that I choose. And the free will we have is, is not a mistake. It's a reflection of God and his ability to choose. Now in this universe, there's still God and his choice reigns over all things. But we have this free will and this freedom to choose, and it's beautiful. Along with that, Adam and Eve had this responsibility. Because there's freedom, then they become responsible. They, they take care of creation, they lead, they, they control, they guide, and that responsibility over creation is, is both a burden, and we know that to be responsible for things is hard work sometimes. Um, my friend said, um, someone who wants to be responsible for the church, somebody who wants to be in charge of the church or wants to be an elder or a leader in the church must have a hole in their head. Because responsibility is a heavy burden and, and there are few joys in it. And I understand what he was saying, that responsibility very often is a heavy thing, that we, we choose how we react in this world and what we do but actually, it, it can leave us kind of burdened and, and, and uh, leave us with lots of issues. Because when we choose badly, when we're responsible for our choices and our choices are not good, then all that mess comes back to us. And yet, when God says, I made you responsible over creation, he's not just saying that to Adam and Eve after the fall. He's saying that to them before the fall, that they're given this responsibility for the universe, for the world, for, for everything that's going on, and, and that they're the ones who have the power to take care. Power, we were talking about, is a, such a complicated thing because it's almost non-existent in what it is. Adam and Eve were the first over all creation the primary leaders of all that was made. Isn't that special? And, and in that way, they're responsible for, for the behavior of all things that they were given responsibility over. And that's supposed to be a beautiful thing. 
And when Paul's writing to Timothy, he says to Timothy, you know, if somebody wants to be a leader of the church, he desires a noble thing. It's, it's a good thing. It's, it's what I designed in you. But it's a heavy thing. And so Adam and Eve wouldn't have felt the weight of it because nothing had gone wrong. They weren't held responsible for things that had gone wrong yet. They were responsible, but they could see the good of it. They were given the, the right to control and move and change things. And their responsibility was such a good thing. Partly, their responsibility was a good thing because they were innocent. They weren't aware of all that sin could be or is. I became a Christian when I was just five or six years old. I don't remember the exact uh, date. I do remember where I was. Um, and I was just a child. I don't, I remember asking again and again for forgiveness. But I didn't understand all that I needed forgiven for. Since then, I've committed a lot more acts of indecency or misbehavior um, and all that is sinful. And I'm, I'm not innocent now the way I was. We think of children as innocent. And yet, even as a five or six year old, I knew I wasn't innocent. Adam and Eve were completely innocent. And there's both sides of innocence. There's the naivety. I, they didn't know that anything could go wrong. And they were so innocent. And, and sometimes we make fun of people for being innocent because we think they're naive and they think they don't know anything. And we, we, we laugh at how, how little they're aware of. But Adam and Eve were innocent like that. They didn't know that they were naked. They didn't know that there could be anything wrong. They just lived and it was beautiful and it was great and life was wonderful. And they were innocent um, and naive. But they were also innocent as in not guilty. There was nothing wrong with them. They were perfect. And that's why we've called the first state of man perfection. They, they were completely innocent. God had no fault against them until they made that choice to do something he said not to. And so as they're living, they're enjoying the goodness of everything. And there is no downside to it. When we see the fall, God also curses the world. And the reason for that is that with the innocence taken away, as in not guilty, the other side of innocence, the naivety, also needs to go away. And so if we were naive but sinful, we wouldn't know we'd need forgiven. And so God curses the world so we know something's wrong, and we feel it's not right, and we don't feel innocent anymore, and then we wonder where our guilt comes from. So Adam and Eve, they were innocent. They were free to live and, and do amazing things, and they were never questioning, never second-guessing, never struggling, never experiencing guilt, because they were absolutely innocent. They had done nothing wrong. The problem with Adam and Eve is that they're one sin from being lost forever. One sin was all it would take to ruin all of this. One choice where God said, don't do this, and they did it. Or the other way around, God said, do this, and they didn't do it. They were one sin away from being lost. When we think about innocence, we might think it's a, a weird thing, and we, we can't understand it because we don't live it. But it was beautiful. They had nothing between them and God, and it was beautiful. But it's that one tiny error away from lostness. Now, the last thing I wanted to say particularly about Adam and Eve and what they were like and what made them special in the way they were created is that they walked with God. God came looking for them in the garden and they walked with God and they talked with God and they were friends with God. They had this real alive experience of God. That's why he breathed his spirit in them so that they were able to have a real relationship, a real life, a real thing. And 
And when you look at all of that, isn't it amazing? Imagine if God had made man like this and left it. We'd have been beautiful and amazing. We'd have been innocent. This world would be a brilliant place. There would be no fall, so there would be no curse. There would be no issues, and it would be a beautiful, beautiful world. And we could look to God and say, wow, you're amazing. And we could say that to him because we could see him and, and walk with him and, and live with him. And if we look at all of this, we could say that that is a beautiful world and man is a beautiful creation. Even if you get no further than this, understand that man is beautifully made. When we get to the fall, we start to ask questions. Does God know what he's doing? Was this the right thing to do? Could he not have done it a different way? And so on and so on. But when we see what Adam and Eve were like, we could just stand back like God did and admire his world and all that he had made and all the beauty of man and the intrigue of man and the questions of man and the conversation with man and the eternal life of man. And we'd have said, that is a beautiful thing. That is a beautiful thing. If we imagine Adam and Eve, we normally draw a picture of them standing with fig leaves over their bits and um, standing around in the garden looking weird. But actually God said, no, this is how I made man to live and work and, and go am amongst my world and, and walk with me and talk about all these crazy things and have a real relationship. And that was perfect. And yet God said, perfect isn't enough. If the first state of man was enough for God, there wouldn't be any more. That would be it. But God said there's more. There's something more beautiful to come. So if we can look at the evidence and say, well, there is something about man that is spectacular. Maybe it can bring us to this point that we can see that underneath some of the issues and some of the things that have gone on, there is some of this beauty still there. The, the problem we have is that there's evidence of some of this beauty, isn't there? But there's also evidence that this beauty has been broken or got lost. Do you understand what I'm saying? Our discussion question asks this, why do both the existence and non-existence of this perfect state create debate over creation? Why? Why is man so questionable and why is all of this so much up in the air um, because of what we've just talked about? We can see hints of the reflection of God. I look at my face in this camera and I think mm, maybe not so reflective of God, but God looks not just at my, my, the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart and he sees more and he, he thinks more of the eternity and the identity of, of man as more than that. We can see some of the breath of God in men, that there's that spiritual longing, that there's that meaning and purpose, that desire for life and eternity. And, and we can say, okay, that's another sign of this perfection that you're talking about. We can see hints of it and it can make us think, yes, there's creation. But then we also see there's not bits of it that, that we make so many mistakes. We're not innocent. We're not clean. We're not pure. We're not very good all the time. And we think, okay, so we've got these double questions of, is it real or is it not? Is it the way it is or is it not? And also, well, if it is the way it is, then why do I sort of see it, but also not see it? And we end up with quite an, a, a weird existential debate. Uh, what is our existence about? What does it all mean? Are we this follower of, of this image of God, this one who's made to walk with God, or are we not? You see, once the perfection gets broken, some of the things that Adam and Eve were get confused. And we start to think, well, it is there or it isn't there. This, this debate leads us to, to lots of issues. We can see that man is still capable of perfect things. I'm not saying man is capable of being perfect. Um, I, I can choose in a moment to do something good, 
something that reflects God, something that brings him glory, something amazingly right in, in, in a moment. I can also, in the next moment or the moment before it, choose to do something that is really against God. And so I can see that man is capable of perfect things, but I also see that sin is evident, that, that perfection isn't what, what, what I've just talked about. That's not what my experience is. And so I have a double debate that sometimes I experience that perfection, but sometimes I don't. Am I man or am I something different? Well, I, I really not sure if I'm the same kind of thing that Adam and Eve were. Because when, when God said to them, don't eat of the tree or you'll die. Did they die? Did they really, at that moment, become something else? Become some other thing? Because I can see the evidence that in some ways there's goodness in me and I can do good things and I can see good things in others. But I can also see the not good things and the brokenness and the mess. And I start to say, well, is this the reality? And that's where people come to all sorts of debates. So the idea of dualism is that there is good and bad in the world. And we are pawns in this crazy mixed up game, this yin and yang idea of there's bad and good and good and bad and there's constant flow in a circle and or you have the the force and and there's the good side of the force and the bad side of the force this tension between good and evil and and you can see both things so people i can understand where people come up with those ideas but the bible is much smarter in how it says it came about it's not equal good and bad. And the one who rules over it is not a mixture of good and bad. There is one God who is good, and what he created was good. And then the mess comes in. Dualism is this idea that there's some kind of even force that equals things out. This Gaia theory, this, um, you know, mystical um, force that, that brings evenness to all things. The Norse folk believed that there was a great tree that, that brought life force to everything. The, the Romans and the Greeks were waiting for Zeus or, or, or whoever to, to, to bring evenness to the force in the universe. The, the pantheists, I think there's lots of gods who are all even and they're fighting over things. That is not what the Bible's saying, and it's not really what the evidence shows. We do have good, and we do have evil. The Bible says they're not evil, not even. They're not on a plane and, and just at war with one another, and, and we'll see who wins. The Bible says that God created everything, and it was good, and then it gets broken. But that the brokenness is temporary. And there's something eternal going on. So dualism is this question, well, I see good, I see bad. Is this what's going on in our world? I don't think it is. But you can understand where that debate comes up. Piety is the desire to be good all the time. If I'm good, then I'll be what I'm meant to be. And there's that desire to say, well, if there's good and evil in the world, I want to do good. And, and so you've got this question of, can we be like Adam and Eve? Can we be good enough for God? Can we be good enough to get to heaven? And the fact is, we're not Adam and Eve. We're not innocent like Adam and Eve. We're not good like Adam and Eve. There is evil in us, not just around us, but in us. And so this idea of piety or, or religious perfection is the idea that we can be good enough for God. And yet, that's not what the Bible says, and that's not what the evidence of the world is. The evidence of the world is that the 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 good and the evil, the evil is not just around us, it's in us, it's choices we make. And so we're not good enough for God. We can't have the sort of piety that will please God. So the debates that people have come from this recognition of there is good, but it's not just good. 
there is this, there is some perfection out there, but this world is not perfect. And this is where a lot of the debates come from. If we follow through the Christian message and, the, and, it, and its response to the debate, I think it makes most sense. Other religions are, drive towards being good enough for God. But Christians say, well, I, I, I messed up. Christianity says we, we're not perfect and we need God to do something. We just need forgiven. And so when we look at the perfect man, Adam and Eve, it leads to lots of debate. When we say that's not what we are anymore. And I really ask the question, am I really not anything like Adam and Eve? Am I really a different kind of creation? Is it a whole different state of man? Am I in a whole different realm? Adam and Eve, after they sinned, knew good and evil, knew they were naked, knew guilt, knew a different thing, and they became a different thing. They were dead to, to their, the world because of sin. They were, they were dead. They were not innocent anymore before God. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He put man in the earth. He said, I'm going to create man specially. We're going to breathe life into him that's eternal. He's going to have a different relationship with me. And it's all beautiful. And then we look around our world and we say, that's not what we've got. This first state of man wasn't meant to last. And yet there are hints of it everywhere. There are hints of what man was and is, what he's capable of, of doing good things, of beauty of wonderful relationship. And yet there's also that evidence that everything's got broken. So when we come to this picture of perfection, we say, well, that's not our reality. The question then is how do we understand our reality? Do we just say, well, this never existed, let's throw it out? Do we say, oh, there's some kind of balance between good and evil, we'll, we just have to find the right way of dealing with it? Do we say, well, well, let's stay on the good side of good and evil and that'll be enough. God will be pleased. Will we follow some religion that says you can be good and then the evil doesn't really matter? Or do we understand what the Bible says? You were made perfect. There's something gone wrong and we need God to change that. I want you to think just a little bit about that question. What debates does it bring to you that Adam and Eve were beautiful? And then why did it all go wrong? What's gone wrong? What does it look like? How has it been ruined? And, and what way do I understand that? Do I throw out the idea that man was created in the first place perfect? Or do I understand what's really gone on to ruin things? So today we've looked particularly at Adam and Eve, what they were like before the fall, and said that, a beautiful thing that God made. And one of the reasons we value others is that we see that beauty still in them. They're still made in the image of God. They've got eternity in their hearts. It's why it's so heartbreaking to watch people ruin the lives of one another, to, 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 to waste one another. There's my phone. I better go get it. Let's... Let's think about the next state of man next week.